we just want to thank you for everyone here, Lord, who has been through um, stuff in life, Lord. I thank you because no matter the pain, no matter the loss, Lord, that will not stand against what your purpose is for everyone here. Lord, I thank you because you see every heart, Lord. You feel every heartbeat. I thank you because you know the sound of every heartbeat here. It is unique. It is beautiful to you. You fashioned every heart that is here tonight. And Lord, I just ask that, Lord, when you feel a sound within them, when you hear that sound that aches, God, I ask that the power of your spirit will reach into the depths and renew and refresh and revive and cause them to know that you are for them, Lord. Cause my sister, my brother to know that you are for them. Nothing can stand against them. When all is said and done, Lord, they are victorious, Lord. When all is said and done, Lord, they won this battle. They won this evil that came upon them. They stood strong and they overcame by the word of their testimony and by the blood of Jesus. Lord, I thank you because you will never leave. You will never forsake them. We thank you for this moment as we step in to, to engage the seven spirits of God. We ask, oh God, that the entrance of your word, your word will bring a light and understanding concerning the truth of these sentient beings that are ours, that are part of our lives. We ask God that we will just be overwhelmed with your revelation and this revelation will become a daily part of our existence. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So today, uh, this week, I didn't give scriptures to read because I just felt like, you know, everybody had a, you know, you're just coming out of Thanksgiving and maybe I'll just give you here and we'll absorb it gradually together. So uh, the first scripture I will go to, I would, I want us to start from Revelations 4, from 5 to 6. So Revelations 4, 5 to 6 is yeah. the New International Version. Okay. Um, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbling, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Mm. Continue. No, that's beautiful. That's perfect. Yeah. So um, we read this. Thank you, June. We read this scripture when we were studying on the Lamb of God. You know, and I remember, June, you were the one that asked when we read this one, you asked that, um, what are the seven spirits of God? I don't know if you remember, but this was when we read this scripture, you, you read it, you sang for us and you asked this question. So I wanted you to read that. Um, so just um, the awareness of the throne of God, you know, I want us to go back to that um, teaching again and, you know, that um, presence where you see the throne of God right there and you see the lightning and the amber and you see the crystal floor, the sapphire pavement framework upon which the throne of God is. Um, and then I want us to now be aware of the seven lamps of fire that were right in front of the throne. They are presently in, in front of the throne as we speak. These are the seven spirits of God. These are beings that emanate from the Father so I want us to be aware that they always show up when it comes to being in the presence of God. They are in the they are in the throne of God. They are in the throne of they are before the throne of your daddy. You know, so anytime you're caught up in the presence of God, you're before His throne. You know that they are standing right there. And in this scripture, they are they are they are said to be the seven lamps of God, um, and that takes us to the menorah. We we, we will build this. This um, seven spirits of God study, you know, and we will also go into the menorah. But I just want us to be aware that anytime, you know, there's seven lambs stands in the Bible, just know that, you know, the Lord is referring to these beings that come from God's kingdom. And then um, we're going to see how this lamps of God, this lamb of God, this um, seven lamp stands, how they are you know, very relational to our everyday life. 
how they are a part of us. You know, we'll see how um, they don't just remain on the throne of the Lord, but they have assignments, you know, to, to fulfill. So um, whoever is in Zechariah 3, 7 to 10, should please read that. The NIV. Yes. Do you want to read all the way through 10? Yeah, I wanted to read all the way through 10, but I want you to to read, um, take 7 first. Okay. Yeah. If this is NIV. Yes. Um, verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my commandments, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, mm. and I will give you a place among these standing here. Amen. I want to assume that everybody has received the teaching on the courts of heaven, you know, in the, in the, uh, on, on YouTube, on Spirit Talks with Nadia on YouTube, because, um, like the first verse that June said, it's a build up from there, you know, and this one that Sally just read is also a build up from there. I just want you to see, I just want us to keep building up on what we have learned. You know, all of that should be foundation as we proceed. So if you remember, this, this scripture that Sally just read was God telling Joshua, after Joshua was cleansed, after all his iniquity was cleansed and blotted out from his life, then the Lord gave this charge. He said that if Joshua will walk in his ways and keep his laws, then he will give him um, charge over his courts and that he will walk among the beings that were in God's kingdom. Those beings that were standing before the throne of God, those beings that would come, as we saw in jo in Job, where the courts of the members of the courts of heaven were gathered, and Satan came amongst them. It was the same thing that happened in Zechariah. You know, that happened with Joshua in Zechariah. So, this was God giving Joshua a mandate that he would, if he would keep the four walk in his ways, obey his commands. He will be able to judge his house, judge his courts, and then he will walk among all of those amazing beings. You know, when we read that, we saw that this is our portion, you and I, because Joshua was an ordinary man like you and I. Zechariah too was an ordinary man like you and I. And they, have, they, they were used by God to draw us into a realm that we are a part of. Um, so, Read the next verse, please. Listen, I listen, O High Priest Joshua, mm -hmm. and your associates sitting before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. Mm -hmm. I am going to bring my servant the branch. Wow! So here we see God talking to Joshua. Continue is in continuation to what He's saying to Joshua. He's saying that. He's saying, Joshua, the high priest, listen, you and your associates that are seated here, I, his God is at, uh, continuing his, his address to, to Joshua. And he said that he is, that him and his associates, his associates there are symbols of things to come. So that, can you guys see that Joshua, there were other people there that were seated, this, this whole activity was taking place in heaven. And God had addressed Joshua, and there were other people there that he's saying that are Joshua's associates. I would think they are men like you and I too. And God said that these men are symbols of things to come. This men are, uh, these men are symbols. Can you imagine God is addressing, he just says, he's Sally. You and your associates, and it's the rest of us, you know, each one of us here, we're all seated there in God's kingdom. And he's like, listen, Sally, you and all your associates seated before you as men symbolic of things to come. We are all symbols of things to come. We are all symbols of a reality that God said will, will happen. We are sons of God will find themselves right before the throne of God. For what purpose? What are we going to be doing there? You know, these were symbols of things to come. We are the ones that came after them. 
And as we engage God in that realm, we are also symbols of things to come. So I want us to personalize this address that God is giving in this scripture for ourselves because we are part of this kingdom. Kingdom. I mean, what, a, what other generation will be, will, will be the people that God was really speaking to? If they are symbols, then who is the real? If not us, who else? I mean, we've learned through so many other teachings that, you know, without us, all these amazing, amazing men of faith we, we, we studied about, you know, could not be made perfect, but with us. So who else was he addressing? If those men sitting there before the throne of God were symbols, then who are we? Amen. Um, so he's, he, you know, he also said, I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. We know that that is Jesus Christ. You know, he was speaking of what will come in the future to, to, to Joshua. Um, please read verse nine, Sally. Mm -hmm. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord almighty. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Hmm. Amen. Amen. Wow. So this is the Old Testament, and this is in Zechariah. When God told that told Joshua and his associates that were sitting before him that they were all symbols of things to come, things that would become a reality, they were just symbols at the time. Now God said that he's setting us, he was going to send his servant, the branch, the branch is Jesus he was talking about. And then he said he was going to send, um, he, then he said that he has set in front of Joshua, the stone, we know that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the, the stone which the builders rejected, who became the chief cornerstone. And he's saying that there are seven eyes on that one stone. I just want us to see the picture that he's depicting now. We came before a throne in Revelations. And before that throne were seven, seven lampstands, which were the spirits of God, the seven spirits of God. And then now we're seeing a stone, which we know is Jesus. And upon that stone, on that stone, before that stone, are seven eyes. These eyes are also the seven spirits of God. Now we have addressed that the, the lamp, the lamp stands, the seven are the spirits of God, the And upon the stone, we see that right in the admonition of Joshua, a human being like you and I, where Jesus, where the seven spirits of God, right? This were part of what Joshua was, was being addressed, you know, like, it's like they came together. It was a full package, you know, I'm sending my servant the, the branch, you know, there are seven eyes on that one stone and I will, in, I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord, and I will remove the scene of this land in a single day. That's what Jesus Christ did in, in a moment, once and for all. You know, there was that one sacrifice that cleansed us all. Read um, Isaiah 11, right, Marie? Is that where you are? Yes. Isaiah 11, yes. From one to four, yeah, please read. And, I have this. and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, mm. the spirit of knowledge mm. and the revelation of and obedient, the fear of the Lord. So where Marie just read now, it's telling us who the seven spirits of God are. So uh, if we were wondering, you know, were wondering, I wanted us to recognize that when we're talking about the branch, you know, this is where it also um, says that the branch is the root of David, right? And a branch out of, um, this talk of Jesse's, Jesse and a branch out of his roots shall grow forth and be a fruit. Jesus Christ is a branch, right? I'm trying to connect this verse she read with the one Sally read, where it talks about the branch. And it talks about the stone. 
And now we're talking about the branch out of Jesse. And upon this branch are seven spirits. The spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of God. The spirit of wisdom. The spirit of counsel. The spirit of might. The spirit of knowledge. The spirit of understanding. These are the seven spirits of God. They are before the throne of God. They are, they were, God, God said he was going to release his son and they were going to function with Jesus. They will rest upon him. All seven of them. They are very different from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He is on the throne. He is not around the throne. The Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son is, are one God. They are the ones on the throne. So the seven spirits of God are different, amazing, glorious beings that emanate from the throne of God. They carry, God has all these facets of himself. God is full of wisdom. He is wisdom. He is understanding. He is all these glorious attributes. He is counsel. But what he does is take these parts of his being in all their glamour and excellence and he places it upon a being. So the wisdom of God, the very, the diverse, the depth of God's wisdom that is beyond anything any of us can comprehend rests in a being. And that being is the spirit of wisdom. And we read a lot about the spirit of wisdom in Proverbs. And as we do these teachings, we're going to take each of these sentient beings and address them and see how we become a part of them. How do they walk with the Son of God in their function on earth to fulfill God's purposes? Then we will also see how, how our lives are transformed by engaging them. So you have the spirit of wisdom. You have a full knowledge of God in one being. You have the fear of God in one being. You have the might of God in one being. You have um, the counsel of God in one being. You have the Lord, the, the anointing of, of the Lordship of God in one being. All of these beings carry these personalities of God that are just mind-blowing and they function to full capacity in that in that area they have they, they are called to function in just like we know um there are situations where gabriel shows up angel gabriel just like we know there are situations where angel michael shows up it is the same with these beings once they show up in certain situations you see that a lot of wisdom if wisdom shows up in a certain situation you see somebody walk in such wisdom that blows your mind away. If the spirit of might is upon a person, you see them express the might of God in a way. Demons tremble, you know, <laughs> things happen, you know, and you're like, wow, the spirit of might is here. So just be aware that there's these seven beings that are, are sent to, to tutor you, to guide you, to uphold you in your walk that you need to align yourself with. So, um, um, in order to bring it into a personal space, uh, we will go into, um, uh, Revelations 1, Revelations 1 verse 4. Yes. Okay. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 to 5. Yes. John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. Yes. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come mm. and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth mm. to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. I know. Like, it just gives me chills. So, John brings a message to all of us. And he's talking about Jesus Christ. And see how he expressed. Well, he before he even talked about Jesus Christ, he talks about he was sending greetings from the seven spirits of God. Like, they are a part of us, just like Jesus is a part of us. Right? And they are sending yes. us greetings. Like they are relational. They are personal. 
They are a part of our existence. They are they are sent to assist us. They are sent to walk this this journey this journey with us. And so he's saying that, hey, I bring you greetings, grace. <laughs> you know, this is a man, a human being is bringing us grace from the spirits of God, the seven spirits of God, and from Jesus Christ. And then he talks about Jesus Christ being the faithful witness. And I like that he says Jesus Christ um, loves us so much. And it is that love that is with that love that causes him to give his life for us. And his blood cleanses us, cleanses us from all sins. You know, I, I want to emphasize that. Um, the amazing thing about, about all this, I, I want you to see how all this ties into our, our existence here on earth. In the ancient um, Jewish culture, only um, kings and like um, senators and, you know, court officials, only rich people could adopt um, sons or, or, or daughters. I mean, most times it was sons because, you know, sons would, you would pass the inheritance from one son to the other, you know. So the, 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 the concept of that was if somebody was not able to have a son, they would adopt a son um, who would inherit their, their, their stuff. But the way things were done in that day was adoption was not adopting babies. So when you think about adoption in the Jewish culture, it was not a, sorry, in the Roman culture of that day, it was not babies. It was grown men, you know, teenagers, 16, 17, or even 20s, you know, they made sure they saw how the man, the, the baby, the person grew up to be a person. Because if you go adopt a child in that day, life expectancy for babies was very short, you know. So there was no point at adopting babies. They would die, you know. So most kings used to adopt, you know. I was researching this and I discovered that most kings um, would adopt sons. Like the purpose of their own adoption was they wanted somebody who would take care of them in their old age. So um, most of them didn't trust their children. Can you believe it? They didn't trust their children to take care of them. And they had so many slaves. So it's either they would see a slave that was so committed to them and decide to adopt that slave as their son so that in the later part of their year, where years when they are not so um, agile, that son will take care of them. And then in, in return, they would inherit everything the, the father owned. Um, I want you guys to realize that this, this process was so real that if a father leaves an inheritance for the adopted son only without leaving for this, the biological son, then that stood like that, like it was as real as that. Like your adopted son became your son, you know? So in the, in the, in, in, like I even saw that, um, Gaius, um, Octavius, whose name was changed to to Gaius Julius Caesar, was actually adopted. You know, he was a full man, and when Caesar, um, Ga um, Caesar Julius Caesar was dying, he adopted him. And he, of course, Gaius is Augustus. You know, the wonderful Augustus you hear about. That powerful name was actually an uh, adopted son, and you know the same thing happened. So. Um, I just want you to, with that picture in mind, how, 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 you know, King, even Augustus ended up adopting a son, you know, to be king. So, you know, it was a very common thing in that culture. You know, those kings were, were adopted children. They were as legitimate as biological children. So in saying that, I'm just trying to let you know that, um, in, in, just because we are adopted by God into the beloved does not mean that we're any less a son than Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus Christ died. And this is why he used his own blood. He's like, I'm the son of God. I am going to use the, my blood to cleanse the sons and adopt them into my father. And this is, you know, when reading this address from John and specifying that Jesus Christ's blood cleanses us from all sin this, this is what they do. This is what Jesus and uh, the, the seven spirits of God, this is what they do. They are 
Jesus Christ used his blood to cleanse us as, and made us sons. And the seven spirits of God are there to, 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 to monitor us and to, to uphold us and to govern us. And why did I bring this whole story? Um, this whole story is because in that culture, when that adopted son is brought before the courts to become adopted, before you began the process of adoption, it is said that the, the judges would bring um, two parchment papers, you know, one of them, one of them will have a record of that son that, for example, Gaius, um, Octavius, his last name was Octavius. For example, that king who was the son of an ordinary man, and some of these sons were, were actually slaves. They didn't even have, um, they didn't have a record of their own biological parents, you know. In the case of this Gaius, for example, or a full-grown man, you will have someone, a whole man, a whole grown man stand in court, and then they put his um, his they put that name, they'll put Gaius or you know, whatever. You put Nadia Johnson there. Uh, my father's name is not Johnson, but yeah, that will do. <laughs> but yeah, you put my name there, you put my year of birth there, you put where I was born, all the things I did, the schools I went to, all my mother, my you know, my median name, all of that. You put all those details on that, and then everybody is there to witness the most amazing thing is there are seven testators in that court in the in the ancient roman um, court system seven testators will be there to witness this whole thing take place to be a witness and then to we'll see how that goes so we okay let me use a paper with stuff so let's say this is all the stuff carrying carrying my life you know this is nadia's story is on this paper you know so when all that is written down this paper will be blank with nothing before anything will be written on this parchment paper whatever is written here has to be erased before this person will emerge hallelujah so what they will do is after they've written all this stuff they will take you know They'll take a wet cloth and then they will wipe all of that away. And then it becomes a blank piece of paper. That entire existence is gone. And then on this wipe, on the, on, on the, on the, on the clean paper with nothing written, that was Gaius Octavius who we're talking about, for example. Now, what is the new name? They will ask the king, what is the new name you want to give your son? Because the record that that former guy had is all gone now. Now the father chooses a new name for his son. And then in the case of Gaius, his name, he was Augustus Caesar. Then, you, you know, for example, you write that out. And then he begins to write all the inheritance that becomes that son's, that, that uh, um, Augustus, that it's Augustus' um, inheritance as the son of the king. Even though in this particular case, Gaius had, I'm just using, sorry, I'm just using um, Julius Caesar as an example. But in this particular case, he was not alive when this was done. He left it in his will. But everything was done in accordance to the Roman, you know, um, culture of that day. So a new name, a new inheritance, a new life. And then those seven testators that were there to witness.